Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, whose life, death, and resurrection makes us, makes you and me, children of God. Amen. So I want to see if you can recognize uh, these words. The story you're about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. I see some of you have already gotten it. For those of you who haven't, how about these words? Where did they come from? Uh, this is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. You got it now? Yeah. Uh, of course, they come from uh, an old television show, right? I suspect that many of you watched it. I know that I did. The show's name is Dragnet. Exactly right, Dragnet. Dragnet actually began as a radio program in 1949. It moved to television in 1951, and it ran until 1959. Now, I didn't watch it during those years. <laughs> I watched it, its revival. It was revived again in 1967 and ran until 1970. In 1987, it actually uh, went to the big screen, uh, starring Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. So Dragnet, the radio and TV program, of course, starred Jack Webb. Uh, many of the shows uh, began with this voiceover. Uh, this is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. Anybody remember what his badge number was? 714. You got it. Exactly right. I carry a badge. I'm a cop. My name's Friday. Yeah, Joe Friday, badge number 714. He was a sergeant in the Los Angeles Police Department. How about this one? Anybody remember his partner's name uh, during the 67 to 70 revival? Bill Gannon. Bill Gannon, exactly right. Of course, played by the very famous Colonel Sherman T. Potter, right? Harry Morgan. Yeah. Wonderful show. Sergeant Joe Friday was a bottom line kind of guy. Uh, he didn't want uh, to hear any commentary. Uh, he didn't tolerate any opinions. Uh, your emotions, uh, they didn't interest him at all. Joe Friday didn't beat around the bush. Uh, he didn't pull any punches or mince any words. He just wanted the brass tacks, the meat and potatoes, no double talk, no hemming and hawing. Get to the bottom line, just the facts. Clearly and simply relate the facts. Just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. Today's another festival day in the church. It's All Saints Sunday, and on All Saints Sunday, we join in a family celebration, a family celebration made possible by our God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All Saints Day is not a day uh, to mourn uh, the dead, but rather a day of celebration a day of celebrating the life that we have in Christ and a chance to look ahead at the joys before us, the joys that await us. Now, our celebration, we will certainly remember those who have died in Christ since last year. We're all members of the same family with them as we confess. Of course, in the, in the Apostles' Creed, we are all members of the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. So All Saints Day is a day to glorify Jesus who by his holy life and death redeemed the lost and made them saints. Saints through the word and water of holy baptism and faith in him. So this All Saints Sunday, like Sergeant Joe Friday, we're not going to beat around the bush. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to pull any punches or mince any words, no double talk or hemming and hawing, only the brass tacks, the meat and potatoes, the bottom line. So as I was driving in this morning, you're probably not going to believe this, but it did happen. As I was driving in this morning, listening to, to classic rock on XM Channel uh, 26, I heard a song uh, recorded by The Who in 1978 entitled, Who are you, right? Who are you? Uh, Roger Daltrey sings in the refrain, who are you? I really want to know, right? Uh, tell me, who are you? Because I really want to know. So today, we're going to answer two questions. The first being, who are you now? 
The second is this, who will you be then? So, first one first, who are you? I I really want to know. Right now, who are you? When someone asks you that question, what is it that you tell them? Who are you? Now, now I don't mean uh, who do you think you are, who do you wish to be, who you were five years ago or ten years ago. No, I mean who are you now, right now, right here today? Who are you? I can tell you who I am. I am David Shoddy. I'm husband to Patty. I'm father to Richard, Jacob, and Hannah. And I'm grandfather to Marlo and J.D. That's who I am. I'm also a pastor here at our Savior Lutheran Church. I'm a hard-headed German and an avid but horrible golfer. That's who I am. And who are you? Now, you've probably been thinking about that for the past few moments, and you've probably come up with a list, probably very similar uh, to mine, of who you are. So with that in your mind, let's get down to the brass tacks, the meat and potatoes. No double talk, no hemming and hawing. Let's get to the bottom line. Who are you? Now, when we were little, uh, the question takes uh, one form. But as we grow, though the form might change, the way we phrase the question might indeed change. The question remains. Uh, When you're little, it's something like, uh, what do you want to be uh, when you grow up? And then it becomes, what do you want to major in at college? Or, or what do you want to your career uh, to be? And then it becomes, where do you want to live? Uh, later, it might become, uh, do you think you should, should change careers? And finally, finally, it becomes, what are your plans for retirement? But the question is always there. It's always there because we are always someone and we are always somewhere Now, now, and we're always on the way to becoming someone and going somewhere, always. Now, these questions, they come up now and again in our lives as individuals and in our life together as a community of faith here at our Savior Lutheran Church. Who am I now? Who will I be then? Who are we now? Who will we be then the questions simply never go away. And the Apostle John actually gives us an answer, and not just any answer. No, John gives us God's answer. Who are you now? So our text in 1 John chapter 3 begins this way. See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. See. Three-letter word that begins uh, John's sentence here. See, it's an imperative verb. It's not an invitation. It's a command. It's a mandate. See, open your eyes, look, listen, wake up, see. See what? See what kind of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Now, I would suggest to you that there's more than a little amazement, there's more than a little wonder at that statement. You see, uh, in John's letters, there is only one person, one person who is ever named directly God's son. I'll come back to that truth in a moment. Only one. And Christians are always and ever called God's children, or sometimes his little children. And I'll suggest to you that that's one of the ways that John is in this verse, expressing a little bit of amazement. And then he doesn't say, see what love the Father has lavished. No, he says, see what kind of love the Father has lavished. What kind of love is this? Well, it's forgiving love. It's Calvary love. It's blood-bought love. It's death and resurrection love. It's sacrificial love. It's an everlasting love, a never-failing love, a never-ending love, and John calls it a lavish love. Don't you just love that word, lavish? I mean, you go into Brahms and you ask for a double-dip ice cream cone, and instead they give you a dozen stacked real high. 
That's lavish. Uh, God is not a nickel and dime, penny pinching kind of God. God is not chintzy and cheap. No, that's not the God that we're talking about here this morning. This God lavishes. He pours it on. Psalm 23, my cup runs over. God doesn't hold back. He's not saving for a rainy day. No, he lavishes his love upon you. You're not unwanted. You are not uh, rejected. You are not unloved. God will not let you go. Uh, The big news of the Bible is not that you love God, but that God loves you. He tattooed your name on the palm of his hand. His thoughts of you outnumber the sand on the seashore. You never leave his mind. You never escape his sight or flee his thoughts. No. You're baptized You are called child of God. God lavishes his love on you. And then John doesn't say either that that we're called children of God. He actually goes on. He sort of repeats himself. He says, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And so we are. So why the emphasis, why the amazement here in this verse? It's because John John actually believes in the concept of family resemblance. And and we talk this way sometimes, don't we? We say, like father, like son. Uh, We say something like the nut didn't fall very far from the tree. We say these things, but John actually believes it. So... Uh, To be the son of the father, that means you are the spitting image of the father. The spitting image, the the living and breathing representation of the living and dying and rising image of the father in whom there is no darkness at all, only light, in whom there is always and only pure and powerful and dying and rising and living love. Only one. Only one is the Son of the Father by right and by deed from beginning to end. Only Jesus who gave himself for all and who intercedes for all. Only Jesus is a son, the Son. But see, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. that We should be called children of God and so we are. That shouldn't actually be true, of course, and and it wasn't easy uh, to make it happen. Uh, John uses words that we're all familiar with, but I I suspect that none of us actually really understands. I mean, he tells us in both uh, gospel and in his letters that we actually had to be reborn. He tells us that we were walking in the darkness and we had to be brought into the light. John tells us that we were living a lie and we had to be brought into the truth. After all, if we are so foolish to say that we have no sin, we would be deceiving ourselves and the truth would not be in us. But see, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. Because of the promise when that water came down on you because of the promises that we see and hear and believe. We get to be children of God because of the Son of God. And surprisingly, incredibly, that is who we are. And so John begins verse 2 by repeating himself. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now. That's what was established in verse 1, right? Now, right now, we are children of God. Now, but not yet. We're in process, right? We haven't fully arrived. Uh, We're not fully developed now, uh, not yet. There's more to come. The best, in fact, the best is yet to come. So, 
What do you want to be when you grow up? What are the purposes of God uh, for your life? Lots of specifics, of course, uh, that I don't know. No one knows, but God knows, and, and he's telling. Who will you be then? John writes, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. So there's God's answer to the question. And so it's supposed to be uh, today, if you will believe it, it will be your answer to the question too. Even now, God is making us more and more like Jesus, but there's still more to come. God's not finished with you yet. Oh, you may indeed think that he is. You may think that you have peaked. Think again. St. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he says, "Uh, God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So there's the now and there's the not yet. When he appears, when he appears, that is to say when Christ comes again, when Christ comes a second time, something wonderful and amazing will happen. A final transformation, a final change will occur. God's answer to the question, and yours too, if you will believe it, who will you be then? You will be, John says, like Jesus. As he is love, so you will be love. As he is pure, so you will be pure. As he loves and does righteousness, so you will love and do righteousness. As he has loved us, so you will love one another. When he appears, you will be like him. Of all the blessings of heaven, one of the greatest will be you. Uh, You will be God's magnum opus, his work of art. The angels will gasp. God's work will be completed. At last, you will have a heart like his. You will love with a perfect love. Uh, You will worship with a radiant face. You will hear each and every word that God speaks. Your heart will be pure. No more bluster and bombast. No more sin and selfishness. Your words will be like jewels. Your thoughts will be like treasures. You will be like Jesus. You will, at long last, be perfect like Jesus he appears you will be like him it will be enough on that day to see Jesus as he is that will change me and you and I will be what God has always wanted us to be children of God who are like the son of God I invite you then today by faith to answer this question with me what do you want to be when you grow up the answer I want to be like Jesus. Now, now, surprisingly, you are the children of God. And then, amazingly, you will be like Jesus in a way that will make you, if I can be frank, a joy and a privilege to live with forever. Until then, until then, until that day, John says, purify yourself. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. So what is this hope? Well, the hope, uh, it goes back to verse 2, the hope that someday I will be like Jesus. And if you have that hope, that one day you'll be like Jesus, guess what? You're going to start living like Jesus now, today. I'll repeat that because it's the main point here in this verse. If you believe that one day you will be like Jesus, you start living like Jesus today. This hope purifies you, it cleanses you, it changes you. So I have a third question today, and I guess it's this. What is sin? 
You know, you ask uh, any, anybody on the street, and they might say that sin is something that, that is either very fattening or, or it's, it's something that's just fun to do. That, that's sin. Well, that's not how John defines it. John says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, John says, sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness means I have no law. I reject the idea of law. I reject the idea that God can give me a law. It's Billy Joel in spades. I don't care what you say anymore. This is my life. I'm the CEO. I'm the captain. I am the president. I do what I want when I want. End of discussion, period. That's lawlessness. That's what sin is. No one's going to tell me what I can and cannot do. But I'm a child of God. Now, and how did that happen? John tells us how. First John 3, verse 5, he says, But you know that he, that's Jesus, he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Take it all away. Not some, not most, not a half of it or three-fourths of it. Take away all our sin. Uh, Jesus is sin's greatest enemy. Jesus despises sin. Jesus hates sin. Why is that? Because Jesus sees and he knows what sin does to our lives. And so he's come to take it all away. You see, Jesus has authority over all sin. Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes it away. He takes away its guilt. He takes away its shame. Jesus takes away the power of sin over you. And Jesus, someday, Jesus is going to take away all the presence of sin, all the presence of sin in our lives. Until then... John goes on to say, no one who lives in him, no one who lives in Jesus keeps on sinning. Uh, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, those sound like some very harsh words to me. Just the facts. Uh, John is saying that the person who lives in Jesus, who has seen Jesus, who knows Jesus, that person cannot and will not deliberately continue to sin. That person cannot and will not deliberately live in sin. You see, sin is not our identifying mark. Sin is not your master. Sin is not my enduring quality. So when you see sin... Uh, lawlessness in your life, when you see darkness in your life, something that looks like someone who is a child of the devil, then purify yourself. Turn away from it. Uh, give that over to the cleansing blood of Jesus and turn away from the darkness and turn to the light. Uh, do not, uh, in fact, do not make a practice of sinning in your life. Interrupt that practice. It's called repentance. John says it this way. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness confess our sin, we renounce our sin, we don't get used to sin. Interrupt the practice of sin and live the new life that is in you because, uh, little children, you are now children of God. You bear the name of Jesus in the world. So honor one another. Honor one another with your words and your actions. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, uh, love, honor, and uphold your husband's children. Uh, children, honor your father and your mother in the Lord. All of you, all of us, love your neighbor as yourself. Honor one another with your words and your actions. Give yourselves uh, to one another. John says it this way, uh, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Uh, so that we may be a community, a community that radiates the light and draws other people uh, to the light, to Jesus. Do that because of what you will one day be.
Don't abide in sin, abide in Christ, because now we are children of God, and then when Christ returns, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. That, dear friends in Christ, that is the meat and potatoes, the brass tacks. That's the bottom line. Amen. Let's stand and celebrate that, shall we?